경애하는 김성은 동지께서 태양절 경축 중요 예술 단체들의 합동 공연을 관람하셨습니다. 조선노동당 총비서이시며 조선민주주의민공화국 국무위원장이신 경애하는 김성은 동지께서는 4월 15일 태양절 경축 중요 예술 단체들의 합동 공연 영원히 당을 따라를 관람하셨습니다. 이는 가운데 경애하는 총비 서동지께서 이 설주 여사와 함께 극장 관람석에 나오시자 전체 참가자들은 위대한 김일성 김성일주의 당의 향교력과 정치력을 백방으로 다지시어 사비주의 위협을 승리의 한길로 억세게 이끄시는 총비 서동지에 대한 다함없는 흠모의 정을 담아 열광적인 만세의 환호를 터쳐올렸습니다. 
in percentage, the moon is nothing. If you take percentage of the star, the moon is nothing. But moon is important than all the nonsense stars. <laughs> but if you take percentage, there is no percentage more. But because he is more, he is important than all these rascal stars. This is the example. Yeah, well, what is the use of taking percentage of the stars in the, in the presence of moon? Let there be one moon that is sufficient. There is no question of percentage. One ideal man. Just like in Christian world, one ideal Jesus Christ. How do you feel about Mao Tse Tung? Huh? What is that? This is how you feel about Mao Tse Tung. In China, he's an ideal man. He's a communist. His ideal is all right. In China, he is. No, his ideal, communist idea, mm. that everyone should be happy. That is a good idea. Mm. But they do not know. How to make a just like they are taking care of the human being in the state, but they are sending poor animals to this land. So, very interesting. Um, Srila Prabhupada here is uh, stating that the communist idea, philosophy, is a good idea because the idea is that ultimately everyone should be happy. Now, um, uh, you know, perhaps we should a little break down, if you're not familiar with communism and capitalism, the two prominent kind of economic structures or philosophies that are, um, how would you say, they, they, they are the economic systems employed by um, countries in the world. A country or a state has a, uh, employs a, a certain type of economic system and the two most prominent are um, communism, which now generally takes the form of socialism, which is a little different, and then also capitalism. So the idea of capitalism is that private, um, private owners, private individuals, they own the means of production. And it's a competitive society, a competitive system, where um, uh, if you are successful in the system, you can earn more, own more, and um, therefore there is competition, there's drive, but there's also inequality. Some people are very rich, some people are overwhelmingly rich, just like Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, ridiculously wealthy persons in the tens of hundreds of billions of dollars and then there are people who have barely anything to eat. That's a capitalistic system, but it's a, a, it's a system of freedom. It doesn't impose necessarily any ideals. It's up to each individual's um, either luck, of course, is not a factor, but his uh, individual capacity um, um, to work, to be innovative, um, to exploit ultimately how, how expert he is in exploiting and uh, then he can work his way up the system and become materially speaking successful. Uh, so there's freedom there in that system and that system in as far as we have experience and materially speaking of course with many hiccups in the road is it's working in some sense. Uh, in comparison to communism, communism, the ideal is that um, the people uh, work for the means of production, although people own the means of production, and uh, the people work for the benefits of the humanity and of the, for the upliftment of the state, and everyone is equal. And no one can uh, benefit more than his fellow man. Each person gets exactly what he needs. And in this way, everyone um, is uh, raised to the same platform. No one is neglected. No one becomes puffed up. So that's the ideal. But the thing is that it has never worked out in history. This has been the critique of um, many philosophers and historical analysts that... Uh, 
uh, communism, while it may be okay in writing, Karl Marx, he wrote the Communist Manifesto, um, it, may, it may be okay in writing, actually, even the Communist Manifesto has many disturbing elements in it as well, um, uh, to do with um, racism and, and classism. Um, but uh, it is... Um, uh, it has never worked out in history. In fact, it's gone. It's been completely butchered as a system, and even modern communistic, any surviving communistic countries, uh, gradually they become attracted to the Western ideals of capitalism. There's no real strict communism, even in countries like North Korea. Um, they are being drifted towards uh, capitalism. Uh, why this is, is because, and uh, <coughs> I had an interesting realization from His Grace Meridia Blue this earlier today. We were watching some movies about North Korea, and um, His Grace commented that uh, um, it is, uh, it's kind of like a utopian idea that people want to um, be satisfied living simply and um, uh, not having a competitive society, kind of a spiritual idea in one sense, but because they don't have, they don't know how to do it, as Srila Prabhupada says in this clip, they don't have the right philosophy, they don't have the right process, um, therefore they don't get any higher taste, they don't get any spiritual taste, they have no satisfaction, and so eventually they have to come to the capitalist system because everyone is looking for pleasure, right? That's why these economic systems are even here in the first place. Capitalism is here and communism are both here to try and satisfy um, the individual and the society as a whole, um, both materially and mentally and um, so on and so forth. So, uh, but... Ultimately, neither of them are actually working out, even in capitalistic societies, as we're going to dive into here in this podcast. They also don't work out. But, uh, yeah, communism is, a, is generally speaking, a, a gross failure. But the ideal that everyone should be happy, that is actually, um, that is actually a, a good thing. Now, <clears throat> because, um, uh, yeah, everyone has a right to be happy. Because every person is actually not just the body, but the spirit soul, eternally part and parcel of um, Krishna. And that means God. So Krishna is God, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And being that every person is his, is his part and parcel, and that God is Ananda Maya Vyasat, or eternally blissful, Everyone also is eternally blissful. It's now just that we've become covered. Now we call ourselves a communist, a capitalist, a Russian, an American, a black or a white, or whatever. That we uh, designate ourselves to a material body. We forget our eternal position. And um, we think the aim of life is to simply develop or decide who gets the means of production and so on and so forth. And um, become dissatisfied as a soul. So it doesn't ultimately matter whether you're a communist or a capitalist. Um, you'll be dissatisfied either way unless you become a Krishnist. So anyway, um, let us now just get into some deeper parts. There's a very interesting conversation uh, between Shama Sundara and Srila Prabhupada. Uh, this conversation is in a book called Dialectic Spiritualism, wherein Srila Prabhupada um, breaks down various uh, philosophers, Western philosophers, and debunks their philosophies. And in this particular conversation, he was talking about Marxism and Karl Marx. Excuse me. So let's see. Shama Sundara is throughout the conversation explaining some of the key fundamental points of communism, and Srila Prabhupada is very nicely smashing it. So let's, let's just have a look. Okay, <clears throat> Shama Sundara says, Karl Marx contended that philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. His philosophy is often called dialectical materialism, 
because it comes from the dialectic of George Hegel, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. When applied to society, his philosophy is known as communism. His idea is that for many generations, the bourgeoisie, the property owners, have completed, uh, competed with the proletariat, the working class, and this property, sorry, and this conflict will terminate in the communist society. In other words, the workers will overthrow the capitalistic class and establish a so-called dictatorship of the proletariat, which will finally become a classless society. Okay, so for those of you who didn't catch that, <clears throat> there are two people in a society, those who have to work, they have to man the factories, work in the fields, create the, the uh, they have to produce, right, foods, textiles, um, everything, power, and then there are those who have the property on which the, that work is completed on. Now, the property owners, um, in, in, a, in a, let's say, a capitalistic society, they're wealthier, they also have control over the, um, the worker class. And these two classes, Karl Marx philosophized, are always in a conflict because the workers are doing the real hard work, but they get paid less and treated, and treated worse also. And the property owners sit back, enjoy, and collect money, live lavishly, and um, also mistreat the workers. So the idea of the communist society is to make it a commune, com uh, common. Everyone is on a common ground. There is no distinction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. And um, it becomes a classless society. So, Sheila Prabhupada is about to destroy this idea of classless society. What actually is a class and why do these exist in society? Sheila Prabhupada says, but how is a classless society possible? Men naturally fall into different classes. Your nature is different from mine, so how can we artificially be brought to the same level? Wow. Okay, so, um, Krishna says in this connection in the Bhagavad Gita, um, Chatur Banyam Maya Shtrishtam Guna Karma Bhagashaha Tasya Kataram Timam Vidhya Kartaram Abhyayam According to the three modes of material nature and the work ascribed to them, the four divisions of human society are created by me. And although I am the creator of this system, you should know that I am yet the non-doer being unchangeable. Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, this is a very um, important point here. Uh, in human society, wherever you look, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a Vedic system or for it to be um, established very scientifically, it is a natural, um, there are natural propensities, naturally, sorry, <laughs> there are natural propensities uh, within all of society. And this is a nice picture I found that uh, kind of breaks these four classes down. This is a, a Vedic model, of course, so <laughs> it's not necessarily that you're going to always see these, these um, uh, dare say, I don't want to make offences to Brahmanas, but um, um, half-clad men with uh, paint on their bodies and bags in their hands. You're not really going to see these in Western society. But this is called a Brahmana, or there is a priestly class, right? So uh, in everywhere in society you have some priestly men, or at least some intellectual men, philosophers, scientists, mathematicians, uh, doctors, Right, uh, those who are doing high class intellectual work, welfare work for the society as a whole. In the perfect Vedic society, the Brahmana is not only a spiritual guy, but he also does this work of a doctor and a scientist and so on because he studies the Vedas, which are the source of all of that knowledge. Okay, and we're going to get deeper into that in just a moment, um, all of these classes. The next uh, level is a uh, Kshatriya, as you can see here, represented by this very uh, angry looking king. Um, so a Kshatriya, as you can probably imagine, is the fighter class or the administrative class. And of course, anywhere we look in society, you, you have politicians. I'm not saying they're all righteous exactly. Um, <laughs> there are definitely the fair share of Boris Johnsons, or maybe Boris Johnson's a light example to use. 
but uh, not everyone, of course, is a is a, um, a perfect example of a of a administrative personality. And they're also fighters. There are soldiers, generals, so on and so forth. So there are these. Oh boy, some really loud cars here in London. Okay, so there's the administrative class. They protect the society. And then you have the Vaishas. So Vaisha is the productive class. These, um, this part of society, they, in the Vedic model, uh, they protect the cows and they also um, raise crops like that. So um, they're also textile traders, mercantile men. And of course, now we can we can go anywhere and find there are businessmen. They own you know large amounts of properties or product lines, or they manage lots of people. Even some of them they raise cows. But <laughs> that latter part has been a little degraded in modern day society. Most of the vaishas are vaishas. There's no word. They're bogus vaishas. They actually kill the cows. But still, that propensity to um, be into trading and managing and making lots of money, businessmanship, that is, uh, that propensity is there. And then you also have the Shudras, and Shudras are worker class. They don't have any necessarily special propensity like the other three classes. They are uh, assistants. They work, they have a, they're usually strong bodied, they can work like this picture depicts. He's uh, using the plow here. And uh, it is stated in the Vedic literature that in this age, it's Kalao Shudra Sambhavaha. So um, everyone, practically speaking, are Shudras, with the exception of a few Vaishas in this age. Um, so pretty much everyone is born to work, that you can see very clearly. Everyone goes to work hard on a job, and the vast, vast majority of people are in the worker class. And it's very interesting that if you um, take a look at Marxist philosophy, uh, as we just discussed, <clears throat> Karl Marx, he divided the uh, society into these two classes, right? Proletariat over here, sorry, over here, and the bourgeoisie over here. He, uh, Marx, never uh, studied Vedic philosophy uh, or around during the Hare Krishna movement, so he didn't get the experience of these two upper classes, because um, as Krishna says, we read this Bhagavad Gita verse, guna karma vibhagashaha. So it's by quality and work. These uh, classes, they are by training. And um, with this age of Kali, the training for these two upper classes of society has been lost, and uh, instead, we just uh, everyone is naturally born a shudra, and then um, vaisha has the some remnants of, uh, of vaisha by blood or by tradition or like that, something like that. Very few, but that tradition is passed down. But pretty much everyone is, has this natural inclination to be a shudra, and by training they can be elevated to these higher classes. But um, in Karl Marx's experience, he only experienced these two. And, of course, the Vaishas are managing the Shudras to employ them in the fields, manage, uh, plow the fields, like that. So, um, because Krishna says these uh, classes everywhere in society, these classes exist, they're natural because they come from Krishna. They are not manufactured. It's not some... Um, uh, it's not that it's natural for people to be classless, and now um, pe by people's greed and lust, they've imposed um, this uh, um, exploitative caste system. Um, the, the castes in society are always there. It is due to the reactions and past actions and reactions to fruitive work um, by your work in this material world if you do something good it comes back to you you get good credit right piety and then if you do something bad you get impious credit if you do something simple you get impious credit that's why um, that basically is the determining system for everything that you can see 
in the manifested world. Why some people are born in a very nice family, with a nice life, they don't face many problems, they've got a beautiful body, they, they're successful and attractive and so many things. Uh, that's good karma. Similarly, if someone is ugly and born in a bad family, you know, in a poor family, in a degraded family, in a in a in a um, uh, dangerous country in the world, that is impious work. Otherwise, how can you explain? Right? No one can explain this. How can scientists can't explain this? I'm sorry to say. Um, most other religions, they also cannot explain why these things are happening. But we have an answer. It's because the soul is eternal, traveling through various species of life, and in the human form is generating, by his free will, he's generating various reactions um, depending on his work. <clears throat> so, uh, therefore, we have these different um, uh, propensities of the body, we have a body according to our past work, and um, if we do nicely, we get put into a Brahminical, even, uh, or a Vaishya, one of the higher caste families, and if not, we get put into a Shudra family. So, being this is Kali Yuga, most people, uh, because this age is very fallen, it's very unconducive in one sense for spiritual realization. Um, so, uh, most people are born into Shudra families. Most living entities that have that kind of karma are born into these low-born families. Not that that's an impediment for spiritual life. Anyway, getting a little off topic. So, Karl Marx <coughs> um, doesn't really understand. He thinks that it's artificial and that he can return to some kind of utopian, um, natural idea where there's classless and he thinks that will be peaceful. Uh, that will be the, the perfection of society. But everyone has different natures, and this is clearly manifested in any society in the world, no matter the different conditionings, right? I, we, in America, you have a completely different culture, practically speaking, to, let's say, Africa, right? Some African tribe, or some um, in China, right? You, these are, are wildly dramatically different cultures, but still you will find that all these classes still exist. The cultures may have never had any contact with each other. Of course, we know they did because the Vedic society at one point in history was all one uh, uh, giant country. But um, in recent history, they have had very little contact at best. Uh, <coughs> so, um, but still, these classes naturally are there. So how is it possible other than it is a natural um, propensity? So uh, it's not possible to abolish classes. They just have to be properly managed. That is what Karl Marx has missed. So let's continue. Shana Sundara says, his idea is that human nature or ideas are molded by the means of production. Therefore, Everyone can be trained to participate in the classless society. Prabhupada. Then, training is required? Samashinda. Yes. Prabhupada. And what will be the center of training for this classless society? What will be the motto? Shamasunda. The motto is, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. The idea is that everyone would contribute something and everyone would get what he needed. Prabhupada. But everyone's contribution is different. A scientific man contributes something, and a philosopher contributes something else. The cow contributes milk, and the dog contributes service as a watchdog. Even the trees, the birds, the beasts, everyone is contributing something. So, by nature, a reciprocal arrangement is already there among social classes. How can there be a classless society? Shamasunda, well, Marx's idea is that the means of production will be owned in common. No one would take advantage over anyone else, and thus one person could not exploit another. Marx is in thinking in terms of profit. Prabhupada, first, we must know what profit actually is. For example, the American hippies already had profit, in air quotes. They were from the best homes, their fathers were rich, they had everything, yet they were not satisfied. They rejected it. No, 
This idea of classless society based on profit sharing is imperfect. Besides, the communists have not created a classless society. We see, have seen in Moscow how a poor woman will wash the streets while her boss sits comfortably in his car. So where is this classless society? As long as society is maintained, there must be some higher and lower classification. But if the central point of society is one, then whether one works in a lower or higher position, he doesn't care. For example, our body has different parts, the head, the hands, the legs, but everything works for the stomach. Okay, well, so there are lots of things to break down here, especially in this last paragraph, so let's just do it one by one. Okay, so Prabhupada first of all says that what, what is profit, right? And Karl Marx's idea is that... Uh, uh, um, the goal of the society is to have profit for everyone, right? Everyone should have equal uh, profit. The capitalist society is evil because one class, they profit more than the other. But what is real profit? Because even if people have lots and lots of money, I mention this <laughs> like every podcast, but um, for example, there's a nice 27 club. And all these very rich celebrities, they become extremely successful at a very young age. They have everything, money or men, women, um, cars, sorry, <laughs> what's that? Women or men, respectively, depending on the gender. Um, cars, uh, money, power, fame, influence, everything, right? They basically become God in the material world. And yet they kill themselves at a very young age, shortly after attaining success. So <clears throat> now you could say, well, that's just a limited example. Maybe they had health problems. There are so many other factors. Okay, that's okay. But, you know, Srila Prabhupada here mentions a very good other example. The hippies, right? If you're not familiar with the hippies, I don't know where you were. For the, are you living under a rock <laughs> since the day of your birth? But the hippies were... Um, uh, kind of movement in the, uh, I, I believe it started in the 60s, um, and they were frustrated, uh, Puruja Prabhu can explain better than I can, but uh, Puruja Prabhu, could you please give a, become a guest star on my show for 30 seconds to explain hippies, why hippies started? Because uh, the uh, uh, Americans, they dropped the bomb on the Japan. <coughs> So, um, and then they had a, a war in Vietnam. So people started uh, um, rebelling. And um, there was a big, after the war, there was a big baby booming. Many uh, people had children. And there were so many that they became hippies. And then another explanation is that Prabhupada explained that the hippies were created by Allen Ginsberg. They saw the... Uh, Rascal Babas, Ganja Babas in oh. India. He saw that they smoking ganja, these rascal, uh, so-called sannyasis in India. <laughs> so he uh, brought the information to the, to America that oh, in India these great saintly persons they smoke ganja, so we should also imitate. Hmm. And from America, the hippie movement spread like this. So through ganja smoking and through uh, Japan bombing. Okay, but what about, isn't there something to do with wealth, that they got frustrated about the wealth? Yes, and they got frustrated because of um, so much opulence. After the 50s, America ah. became really like the world reader, um, leader. It was very, very opulent country, America. They had nice cars, everything, McDonald's. There's lots of opulence. So uh, the hippies, they it was kind of like the next step. Like we got all the opulence, all the money, all everything. Now the next step is spiritual life, frustration. There's a whole conversation with Alan Ginsberg means that frustration means, I forgot exactly the name of the conversation with Alan Ginsberg, it's called frustration, something with frustration. Yeah, if you have everything, you must be frustrated. Then the next step is Krishna consciousness. Sure, Prabhupada. Attractive yeah. home. <clears throat> yeah, so um, that is... Uh, thank you. I, thank you very much, Prabhu. That was... Even more than I was expecting, a real nectar bomb. I was just expecting that my what I was my idea that uh, uh, about success, and they got they got frustrated because of an overindulgence in opulence. But I got a multi-dimensional answer there from you, so thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go with the the um, lattermost option there uh, as my convenient explanation. 
So the hippies, uh, they got, uh, yeah, they became um, saturated by material uh, profit, right? So um, they had everything. And what to speak of just, uh, um, they had, uh, I'm just showing a movie here. Right? This is life in the 50s. You can see beautiful mansion. Uh, it's not exactly, you know, people are living in this, they got this nice uh, clothes on. Uh, all this new technology, very idealistic life, the American dream. Actually, that's the name of this movie, is Living the American Dream. Fridge is full of uh, boga to offer to the Lord. Just kidding, that's food they're taking. <clears throat> so, very opulent life. Seemingly very happy, materially speaking. But, um, um, what to speak of just that, that, of course, they had the grades automatically included that Karl Marx was going for. He was just looking that everyone becomes, um, you know, uh, well fed. But they had even more than that. And still, a huge amount of young people at the rightest age for this material enjoyment, they became fed up. They kicked out all this material enjoyment. And like Prabhu just very nicely said, then they started looking for something higher, some spiritual life, and many of them came to Krishna consciousness. So, uh, <clears throat> now if profits is material things, then why all these um, young people became hippies? Right? That, that defeats the whole idea that profit is something material. That uh, the human endeavor, what, why people are struggling so hard in the world, um, to satisfy themselves is also is the answer, right? People are, as I said in the beginning, people are um, working very hard so they can somehow or other become happy. And that happiness or that profit, um, if we say it's from material things, that's proven wrong on a regular basis because no one is ever satisfied by any amount of material things. I also have the experience, Bhuruja Prabhu also has the experience, I'm sure, that um, you can have material things. I personally come from a wealthy family, and uh, I can say that before I became a, um, <laughs> practically speaking, in the Western countries, they can say a beggar, uh, a monk, um, I had everything. I had uh, cars and a nice, uh, a nice big house and rich friends and also wealth myself, and I was not at all satisfied. So how, um, you know, and Prabhupada says later on in this conversation very nicely that Karl Marx is thinking like that, that profit means grains, um, you know, that to increase the production or to change the hands of who is holding all the production because he comes from a situation where people are very much starving, <laughs> not just poor, but starving completely poverty-stricken. So they're basically desperate. They don't even have the uh, time to think about spiritual life because they're trying to survive even materially. So then he, you know, he, he doesn't have any higher ideal. It's actually animalistic just to think that uh, economic production is uh, the success of one's life. So... Um, <clears throat> Yes, so, uh, and, and uh, okay, so the next thing that Prabhupada brings up here is that the idea of classless society is um, not even created in the communist experiments. Now, Prabhupada lists the, the example of Moscow here, but um, I don't have any videos to show of Moscow, but what I do have is uh, some um, more Kim Jong-un, because Kim Jong-un is a very vivid and funny example. Let's go to some more Kim Jong-un. This is, this is what Kim Jong-un does with money raked from the citizens of his country. $190,000 on spirits, 140 on champagne and wine, as well as a further 70,000 on beer that year alone. Due to his role as a nation leader, Kim will tend to use limos when making public appearances. One of his frequent vehicles... I'd also like to note before we get into this that he, Mr. Kim Jong-un has a hilarious bodyguard setup. This is really awesome. I have to say, the 12 bodyguards just start doing a quick jog around his car to form an impenetrable shield. 
around his limo. So you're going to have to be in for a treat when you see this. Vehicles is the W221 Mercedes-Benz S600 Pullman Guard. He's used the limo during his international travels. Kim's version was bought sometime between 2008 and 2013. The 21 foot long limo has been modified to protect Kim. As a result, its body is armored and also has bulletproof glass. Mercedes-Benz has no idea how Kim managed to get one. As in 2006, the UN put a sanction of North Korea importing luxury goods. The Pullman has a multimedia system and reclining seats. It also has the option to install rearward-facing seats to hold meetings within. Its value is at around $1.6 million with all the modifications. Another limo Kim sometimes uses is the Mercedes-Benz Maybach 62. This 21-foot-long car first came out in 2002. It too has an entertainment system and reclining rear seats. Since it's Kim's, it's also been modified to resist any form of attack. Without any modifications, the starting price for a limo of this size is around $500,000. One of North Korea's big creations was the Masik Rayong Ski Resort. It only took 10 months for the resort to be built. It was completed in 2013 and opened to the public in 2014. The resort is said to have been built to draw some attention away from South Korea hosting the Winter Olympics in 2018. The Masikryong Resort is at the summit of Taiwa Peak at nearly 4,500 feet. On top of the ski slopes, the resort also provides a luxury hotel, an ice rink, restaurants, and swimming pools. The first stage of building the resort is believed to have cost $35,340,000. North Korea believed they would make nearly 19 million in tourism per year. Kim is also said to have looked at increasing the resort's area by another 260 miles, which would cost an estimated $8 billion to achieve. In 2016, New Zealander professional freeride skier Sam Smoothie. Anyway, so you know, we're going to watch all of that. But um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting, you've got a little sneak peek in there also um, of the higher classes of Kim Jong Un's society. Now, um, uh, well, they won't show you on any of this footage because it's actually illegal to do that in North Korea. Is they won't show you the impoverished areas where people are suffering like anything, being um, tortured, starved, and forced into labor camps. Um, that's well, you can't film that. So what they can film is the upper class of people or those who are very loyal, good citizens, and they're able to live in these um, developed parts of the country, go to ski resorts, indulge in nice foodstuffs or foodstuffs at all. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, even though it's meant to be a classless, com communist society, right? Commune. Uh, actually, it's not the fact. It's not possible. There are divisions everywhere. Um, yes. Because if one person is looking, you know, uh, this is one of the problems. If you're uh, working as a, sweet, a street sweeper, uh, but actually you're very intelligent, you will not be satisfied in such a position. Right? Because you're working for your own sense gratification. So you're thinking, well, I, I shouldn't be, I'm, I deserve much better. I'm more qualified. And uh, so naturally, um, do better, they get recognized, um, they do better work or more um, productive, uh, efficient, contributing work, and then they get recognized by the society, they get better positions in the society, it's unavoidable. And you can see this everywhere in the Soviet society also, there were higher ups, right? <clears throat> and eventually, it culminates in the leader of the society being the most... Um, uh, exaggerated characterist, uh, um, caricaturist uh, example of um, class division. The leader of a communist society, of which there always is, whether it's Lenin or Stalin or Mao Zedong or Pol Pot or uh, Kim Jong Un, um, every single time there is a supreme leader of the society, and he and all his close family, higher ups, and well wishers. They all are living very lavishly, especially the leader. Usually he's worshipped as good as God. So this is a very interesting um, uh, aspect. Also, I just wanted to show you a clip from another. I'm using Kim Jong-un a lot because this is a very interesting thing. You know, we have lots of footage and 
study and documentaries made because this uh, country is, is practicing communism right now. And you can even go there and observe it, and it's uh, uh, so it's kind of an interesting example to use. So uh, in North Korea, they worship Kim Jong Un and also the previous leaders, Kim Jong Il, and uh, I can't remember the other one. They worship them as good as God. So this is a funny manifestation of that. Let's just have a look. Observe us. During our first visits here, we were like many foreigners, intrigued by their omnipresence. But the more often we visited, the less we noticed them. The same does not apply to North Koreans. Cyclists are required to dismount from their bikes and look upon the statues of their leaders. Cars must slow down. Passers-by turn to gaze at the images. Shortly after Kim Jong-il's death, a young upper-class woman tried to explain what the leaders meant to her. It's a bit like you with your Jesus, she said, except for us, Jesus would also be a member of the family. In the heat of the summer, we occasionally saw a fan cooling the portrait of the leaders. <laughs> so, you might think that's crazy, and it is crazy, because these are mortal men. But actually, Sheila Prabhupada says that this idea is actually good. It should simply be applied to Krishna. And it's interesting, because if you take a look, um, even though pretty much actually always in communism, it's atheistic atheistic society, atheistic philosophy, Marxism is atheistic, um, and so also is uh, communist North Korea, they, uh, they ban Bibles, uh, um, uh, they ban any kind of, there's no priests, there's no churches, nothing, it's a completely atheistic uh, society. Uh, still, there is a na that natural propensity of the soul, because as I mentioned before, the natural propensity of the soul is to worship uh, Krishna, as part as his part and parcel, to not just worship but also love Krishna, um, adore him, think of him always. Mamana Bhagavan Bhakto, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. Always become my devotee. Always think of me. Pay your obeisances to me. Right. Very interesting. This is a, the natural propensity of the soul. So even if it's suffocated by a communist regime it still manifests as worship of the so-called supreme leader of that particular society. So here you can see, <laughs> they're actually treating a picture of Kim Jong-il and Kim, jo uh, Kim Sung-un, or whatever his name is, um, uh, yeah, as like a deity of Krishna. They have the fan here, right, cooling him, just like how devotees are cooling uh, uh, Krishna with chamara and peacock feather and, you know... Why don't you show them? Yeah, I'm gonna show you some footage of devotees doing it. No, that's fan. No, I'm, I did. I just did that. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, and people here, as you can see, they're getting off their bikes, right, gazing at the various images of Kim Jong Un, right here. Amazing. Both these, all three women, they gaze at exactly the same time. So this is Majaji uh, Mam Namasku. Always pay your obeisances to me. So the soul is paying a basis as to some higher ideal. Here they are also, these boys are also bowing down. So, of course, this is wrongly placed. Uh, and when it's wrongly placed, of course, the men become mad with power. And then we start to see uh, uh, the society becomes um, dissatisfied. The difference is that Krishna is the supreme, complete whole. If you worship Krishna, automatically you are satisfied because you're Krishna's part and parcel. If you only think of Krishna, if you only worship Krishna, or pay your obeisances to Krishna, please Krishna always, um, then you automatically become satisfied. It's not like a separate, you're not separate from Krishna. You are just like the finger is part and parcel of the body. We've explained this so many times on this podcast. 
getting crazy now. Just kidding. This is the absolute truth. Always fresh. Just check out this verse from Shima Bhagavatam. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it right on the screen. Four thirty one fourteen. Very nice. Yata Tarumula Nisichinena. As pouring water on the root of a tree energizes the trunk, branches, twigs, and everything else, and is supplying food to the stomach, enlivens the senses, and limbs of the body, simply worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead through devotional service automatically satisfies the demigods who are parts of that Supreme Personality. Demigods are those who are administering all the material affairs, the, the rains, the sun, the food, the even your own bodily senses, uh, Everything. So automatically, every, everything becomes uh, satisfied or, uh, or um, works very nicely when you worship Krishna. And ultimately, Yeyatma Suprasidati, that's also stated, I also have that one here. Uh, hold on, that's a different thing. Okay. Devotional service must be unmotivated and uninterrupted to completely satisfy the self. Right? So when you worship Krishna and Krishna only, not only do the demigods become satisfied, you also become satisfied as Krishna's part and parcel. Then it's perfect to have, it is a perfectly bona fide system to have one leader, one personality, and everyone worships him if he's perfect. If he's either Krishna or the perfect representative of Krishna, because if you please the perfect representative, naturally, Krishna also will become pleased. When you apply that to an imperfect personality, like Kim Jong-un, like so many, then the society is in shambles, and the people are have to be forced at gunpoint to uh, praise the leader and appear to be happy, just like you can find um, uh, a, a North Korean, let's see, very famous picture. Hmm. So this was at the de after the death of Kim Jong Un. You can see there are these pictures of uh, people uh, crying, uh, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, well, they don't show it here for some reason, but I, I originally, wow, it's kind of weird how they remove these images. But uh, originally, you could see that um, mm, they had these people, these people had guns to their heads, but they seem to have filtered these pictures now. Huh, that's weird. Anyway, I remember seeing pictures like this, and then actually there were guns off to the side where people were being forced to cry at the death of Kim Jong-il. I mean, Kim Jong Il was forcing these people to to, live, to like work in work in the fields with practically no pay, and they like had to bury their children in the same field they were growing crops in for the upper classes of society. So I don't think these people were really morose over the death of Kim Jong Il. But anyway, <laughs> that that you know you can find someone else can find that picture for me. So um. Yeah, so when that's applied wrongly, then we see these disastrous results. And then the other point that... Uh, okay, well, I already kind of mentioned that here. Um, yes, so... Now, uh, what is the solution? Okay, we're kind of getting a little bit on time here. So, what is the um, uh, solution? Uh, the solution is that everyone should work for Krishna according to his propensity in the uh, Varnashram and Dharma. The society is naturally divided into these particular um, uh, divisions, as I mentioned before. And if everyone works according to their propensities and is trained up how to nicely act, the economic production, which Marx was so much adamant about, that works very nicely because the demigods are satisfied, right, if you serve Krishna. Um, so the, the grains are produced, the flowers are blooming, um, the rains are going on. So the, your economic production is very nice, the material side of life is happening nicely. 
and also everything is administered very well. You have the Brahminical class, they're guiding people in spiritual principles, giving advice to the Kshatriyas and the Kshatriyas. They're administering the society very nicely, protecting everyone. The Vaishyas are being protected, so they are in turn producing food for the whole society, and the Shujas are assisting everyone else in their propensities and making everything go even more smoothly. So in this perfect class full society, not only uh, is it um, uh, uh, not artificial, it's based on the natural propensity, uh, also everyone is at the same time equal. There's economic development, everyone is satisfied according to propensity, um, and there is also a competition who can please Krishna the most effectively. So competition is also there. Competition is not artificially uh, repressed. And at the same time, um, most importantly, uh, um, uh, I just lost that point now. Um, you have the, uh, everyone is, so everyone is equal. <laughs> That's the most important point, right? Communism, everyone should be commune. So, um, Everyone is equal in society. Why? Because they're working for the same goal. They're all working Krishna. The point is the same, to serve Krishna. You know, you might say in communism, the point is to serve the state. But as I said before, the state is imperfect. Even if you serve the state, because the state is limited and imperfect, it can't necessarily satisfy your needs. Nityo nityanam, chetanas chetananam, eko bahunam yobhidadhati taman. There is one eternal and many other eternals, um, one supreme eternal among, amongst many eternals. But the difference between the supreme eternal, or God, or Krishna, is that he is supplying all the necessities for the other eternals. All the little, minute souls, me, you, your dog, <coughs> Karl Marx, all these different living entities, they're being supplied everything by Krishna. So the state is not God. It's not perfect like Krishna. However much um, nicely structured or however perfectly you execute the Communist Manifesto, it will never become perfect. And therefore, no matter how nicely you try to make everyone equal and work very hard for the benefit of human society, it will never pay off. People can never be adequately provided for unless they, or are even satisfied in their occupation, unless they serve um Krishna. Uh, so, um, yeah, Srila Prabhupada very nicely elaborates on that just here. Let's read. Prabhupada will express it nicer than I ever could. Um, okay, Shamasunda says, um, Marx says that if everyone is engaged according to his abilities in a certain type of production and everyone works for the central interest, then everyone's ideas will become uniform. Prabhupada. Therefore, we must find out the real interest. In our International Society for Krishna Consciousness, everyone has a central interest in Krishna. Therefore, one person is speaking, another person is typing, another person is going to the press or washing dishes, and no one is grudging because they're all convinced they are serving Krishna, Shamatunda. Marx's idea is that the center is the state, Prabhupada, but the state cannot be perfect. If the Russian state is perfect, then why was Khrushchev driven out from power? If he was elected premier, sorry, he was elected premier, why he was driven out from power? Shamasunda, because he was not fulfilling the aims of the people. Prabhupada. Well, then, what is the guarantee the next premier will do that? There is no guarantee. The same thing will happen again and again. Because the center, Khrushchev, was imperfect, people begrudged their labor. The same thing is going on in the non-communist countries as well. The government has changed, the prime minister is disposed, the president is impeached. So what is the real difference between Russian communism and other political systems? What is happening in other countries is also happening in Russia. Only they call it by a different name. When we talked with Professor Kotovsky of Moscow University, he told him he had to surrender. Either he must surrender to Krishna or Lenin, but he must surrender. He was taken aback at this. That was what I was mentioning before, earlier on in the podcast, you must surrender to some superior personality, so even if you have an atheistic communist society, you will end up worshipping worshiping some Kim Jong-un. Very interesting, right? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so as Srila Prabhupada perfectly expressed here, 
um, uh, the leader has no capacity to perfectly fulfill the aims of the uh, people because he himself is imperfect. And not only that, the very philosophy and system of communism is compiled by an imperfect person, Marx. Right? Now, whether you now call that, some people will probably get agitated at me, that it's not, no, it's not just communism. You know, communism is old story, now it's socialism, and socialism is so much more developed, and we can see countries are also, the Scandinavian countries, they're socialists, and whatever. It doesn't, it's not, um, all of these systems are developed by imperfect conditioned souls. So they will never perfectly fulfill the aims of the people. They will never fulfill the soul. And what is the use? Krishna already gives the perfect system. Guna Kama Vibhaga Shaha. Chata Maya. What is that? Chata Vanya Maya Stadishta. So the system is already given. Already given. Srila Prabhupada already explained it very nicely, philosophically. Uh, there's no necessity uh, to try and use these so many different isms. When I was doing research on this capitalism, communism subject, I had a realization when Prabhupada is talking about how they've developed so many different isms. Mm -hmm. You have uh, socio-capitalism, anarchism, communism, capitalism, of course, and just an endless list of different isms. Why are there so many different isms? Because not a single one of those isms has worked. So everyone's always trying to develop another one. But uh, the Vedic system was going on for millions of years perfectly and it's only when we try to introduce these different isms that everything started going awry and it's gone so bad especially in the case of communism that we have hundreds and millions of uh, um, genocide victims as a result of um, an imbalance in power and uh, um, 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 how do you say uh, Philosophies that are um, garbage. Garbage. That's kind of the most clear way to say it. Garbage philosophies. So um, yes, uh, if the center is Krishna, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You'll be satisfied in your work. In communism, intelligent people are forced to do, you know, um, nonsense work, so they become begrudged. And uh, um, some, oftentimes nonsense people are put in important positions, so uh, everything is um, nonsense. <laughs> so in Krishna consciousness, uh, because the aim is Krishna, no one is begrudged. Everyone is always satisfied because um, he's working for Krishna. And under the direction of the spiritual master, he's being engaged in his propensity also. So... Uh, not only is he working and becoming satisfied himself, but also society is going on nicely. So there's no other uh, better philosophy um, than this uh, Krishna consciousness movement. Uh, there are now there is a re-push now for communism. I was just on the street here in London. I saw some big communist um, party that's going on here soon in London. Many speakers will be here, and uh, there's some um, new personalities are popping up trying to promote communism and say that it's people who are actually very happy under communism even in the face laughing in the face of labor camps and many big frowns from um, um, uh, North Korea and survivors of, uh, of Soviet communism um, they say that you can be happy in such a society so uh, to that we say but just please kindly study uh, this wonderful philosophy Srila Prabhupada has given us. And we can also go a lot uh, deeper um, on, on that. Uh, but I'm just going to read uh, one quote uh, from Srila Prabhupada here um, that nicely will uh, uh, um, summarize everything I've been saying. Okay. Now, Prabhupada says, um, okay, this is pretty much a summary of everything I said. Uh, Srila Prabhupada here says, that is useless. 
in reply to uh, Shaman Sunja saying, the goal is the production of material goods for the enhancement of human well-being. Prabhupada says, that is useless. Economic production in America has no comparison in the world, yet still people are dissatisfied. The young men are confused. It is nonsensical to think that simply by increasing production, everyone will become satisfied. No one will become satisfied. Man is not meant simply for eating. He has mental necessities, intellectual necessities, spiritual necessities. In India, many people sit alone silently in the jungle and practice yoga. They do not require anything. How will increased production satisfy them? Okay, that's just to quickly note on this point. Um, if you think we're lying here, <laughs> there's very practical experience. If you go to any Hare Krishna temple, just like the one we have here in London, or there's a nice one over there in Slovenia, uh, Bliss Slovenia, you will see that devotees are practicing Krishna consciousness. They need very, very little. All they need is their wooden chanting beads, little prasadam, the little simple foodstuffs, and to preach to others, and they feel completely satisfied. Practically nil material necessities devotees need. So uh, you, it's difficult to find people sitting alone in the jungle and practicing yoga. But you can find devotees in every city in the world, and uh, like the one here in London, and you will find that uh, they require very little, right? So, but those who are increasing their production, they're dissatisfied. So to say that to increase production is uh, satisfaction is to, is uh, the people who are practicing Krishna consciousness are the living evidence against that philosophy. So anyway. Um, if someone were to say to them, if you give up this yoga practice, I will give you 200 bags of rice, they would laugh at the proposal. It is animalistic to think that simply by increasing production, everyone will become satisfied. Real happiness does not depend on either production or starvation, but upon peace of mind. For example, if a child is crying, but the mother does not know why, the child will not stop simply by giving him some milk. Sometimes this actually happens. The mother cannot understand why her child is crying, and although she is giving him her breast, he continues to cry. Similarly, dissatisfaction in human society is not caused solely by low economic production. That is nonsense. There are many ca causes of dissatisfaction. The practical example is America, where there is sufficient production of everything, yet the young men are becoming hippies. Uh, they are dissatisfied, confused. No, simply by increasing economic production, people will not become satisfied. Marx's knowledge is insufficient, perhaps because he came from a country where people were starving, he had that idea. So, um, yes, I think that's kind of like a concise summary of uh, this particular topic. Thank you very much uh, for joining me on this episode of the Bliss Podcast. Please join me next week for another episode. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about the status of the movement. Thank you for the suggestion from Bhakti Neil Prabhu. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. Hare Krishna. Also, please go check out the rest of the channel for even more content. We're regularly uploading here. Harry Nams on the street in London and all of our other podcasts. We have many, many, many podcasts. Subscribe, like, and share with your friends. Hare Krishna.